think all of us have experienced our own troubles, so maybe let's expose the soft underbelly of our own lives <laughs> and, <laughs> and talk about some of the issues that we've had growing up in our push toward maturity. Fun segment this is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bible Geeks Weekly Podcast. This is episode 85. I'm Brian Sheely. I'm Ryan Choi. And thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. We are in week 45 of the End of the Book Bible Reading Program, which means we're in Hebrews chapters 3 through 7. Have we figured out who wrote the book of Hebrews yet? We didn't talk about that on the last episode, so. Definitely Apollos. Oh, Definitely. yeah. Definitely not Paul. That's uh, let's just be clear. That's, I mean, that's uh, I'm just putting my flag down here. No, I have no idea. But uh, <laughs> I have opinions that we really shouldn't spend too much time on. <laughs> yeah. But I was thinking this week, I have this widget on my phone now and it cycles through all my old photos. And it's been really interesting to see like you and your family have popped up on my phone over the last few weeks since I've put this up there and old Christmas photos, old events and things back from the past. And I started finding a bunch of these old photos of me in high school. And man, I know that you knew me back when I was in high school. And I'm kind of honestly surprised that you still talk to me today. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back to those photos, it was like, all of the old hairstyles that I had and the baggy pants and the just wacky, zany antics that we always used to get up into just kind of reminded me about growing up and mm -hmm. how, as I watch my daughter, who's now nine, as she grows up, growing up is super weird and it's hard. And as we get into this section here in Hebrews, you start to really see that spiritual growth specifically is also hard. And it's something that we can find ourselves just face palming, you know, not totally un not understanding why we acted certain ways or why we did certain things. And as we mature, hopefully we'll move beyond those kind of juvenile kinds of activities. And I think that's what the Hebrew writer really is trying to do here. Get them mm -hmm. to grow, get them to move beyond their youthfulness or their immaturity in Christ and push them towards something bigger. So we'll talk about that a little yeah. bit later in the episode. Some of our growing pains. If you want to hear us get super personal after a little while, <laughs> that's where we're going. So before we do that, though, let's go and find Jesus here in Hebrews chapters 3 through 7, week 45, like I said, of our reading plan. So where is Jesus here? I saw Jesus, especially his humanity, in his garden prayers. Mm -hmm. And in Hebrews 5, verses 7 to 10, we kind of get another account of the Garden of Gethsemane, really, just like we get in, in the various Gospels here. The Hebrew writer gives his account, some information on that moment. And it says, verses 7 to 10 of chapter 5, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. There's a lot there. <laughs> yeah. And earlier, the writer talked about how Jesus had been tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. But what does that look like, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever we think about Jesus being tempted, well, you could think about all ways. You could think about all these different kinds of temptations, not necessarily the specifics, but the different ways that we get pulled into wanting something that we shouldn't want. And Jesus had legitimate temptations. I mean, there's no other way to, I think, properly respect all of these texts about Jesus' humanity and his temptation and always like we are. But here we find, I think, a particular example of what that looks like. We might think about his temptation in the wilderness, but what about his tearful prayers in the garden as he's really having to decide to yield his will to God? And Jesus could have resisted the Father's will, but he surrenders his will to God the Father's. And, and that is really something the writer is focusing on in this context, in this passage about Jesus being a great high priest. So mm -hmm. you might think, why does this make Jesus a great high priest? And I think it has to do with 
him being able to relate to us and to our humanity and understand what it means to have to learn obedience, what it means to cry out for something, to want something, to ask for something, to be at some level divided, and the weakness of looking at tomorrow and knowing it's going to be painful and awful and hard and yet choosing to surrender to it, to what God wants us to do in that hard choice. And I just think of him in that garden looking forward just a few hours to this brick wall that he's going towards at a thousand miles an hour. And for me, what I take from this right now is that I need to learn to do what he learned to do. I need to learn to pray that prayer of surrender, of relinquishing what I want and being wholly one with the Father's will as Jesus was. And sometimes we sing about prayer like it's entering the Garden of Eden. There's a couple different songs I like. Mm -hmm. Like, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses, and he walks with me and he talks with me. And this is picture of going to God in prayer is like walking through the Garden of Eden with him. But if we want to walk with him in the Garden of Eden, we have to walk with him into the Garden of Gethsemane. (laughs) I have to learn obedience, right? I have to learn to think like Jesus did when he prayed, not just, I'm so glad I get to enjoy the blessings of fellowship with you, but in the most difficult times, I'm willing to give up the struggle and become one with God's will. I'm willing to yield my way. And and I think that prayer of surrender, that prayer of deciding to align our will with God's will looks different for each of us. And when I say surrender, that might sound easy or yielding. It's it's anything but. It's giving up a kind of fight against God and deciding with resolve to stand with God. And it's just something that I think every day we have to, to search ourselves, ask God to search us, and see it where in our lives, if there's any any place that we need to give way for his will. And without doing that, we can't grow in him. I think as you bring up Jesus' example there, though, while you talk about this prayer of surrender, which is where Jesus ultimately winds up, not my will, but yours be done, he starts it by asking for what he wants. Exactly. There is a back and forth there. There is Mm -hmm. an opportunity for us to express ourselves to God, and he wants us to do that. He wants us to, to cast our cares on him because he cares for us. And as we pray with boldness and faith, aligning ourselves with his will, we tell him what we want. But we also recognize, like Jesus learned here, with reverence, we bow ourselves and say, but it has nothing to do with what I want. And so Mm. yours be done. And that's just a great reminder from Jesus. And I always forget that this is mentioned here in Hebrews. So I'm glad you brought it out. You kind of picture the Garden of Gethsemane in that time back in the Gospels, but here it is again, mentioned yeah. right in the midst of all of this other stuff in Hebrews. Yeah, yeah, and it, it really paints quite a picture. We might think of Jesus saying, you know, if it's okay, I'd love to get this, <laughs> but uh, but your will be done. You know, mm-hmm. this was anything but casual. It says, with loud cries and right. tears, he's offering up prayers and supplications to him who could save him from death. And he was heard. He was ultimately vindicated. He raises from the dead, but he still yielded his will and yielded ultimately his life to the purposes of of the plan that he came to fulfill in Mm -hmm. obedience. So, yeah, that's I thought that was pretty powerful. Where did you find Jesus here? So I got hung up right at the beginning of the reading in Hebrews 3. (laughs) Like one (laughs) word just popped out at me. I was like, I didn't know that word was there. (laughs) And so I found Jesus, interestingly, as the apostle. Yeah. Which is a weird way to think about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So there in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. So the Hebrew writer, he focuses a lot more on Jesus as the high priest, which he mentions here. Mm -hmm. He spends time in this week's reading talking about that. And obviously in this chapter, he's really focusing on the fact that he is greater than Moses. But this word apostle is just mentioned in passing. It's never really followed up on. 
I thought maybe this was a translation choice by the English Standard Version, so I started looking at some of the other translations, and all of the other English translations that I could find all use this same word, apostle. This is the same exact word, apostolos, that's used to refer to the 12, and when Paul refers to the quote-unquote super apostles, and so it's almost always, in every single case, used to refer to the disciples of Christ who he called the 12, except for here. This was, maybe I'm wrong, you can correct me on this, but I think this was the only time I saw this word in reference to Jesus himself. And so, Mm. in the same way that Jesus chose men to serve as his messengers and his delegation on earth, Christ is God's special messenger here too. That's what he told the apostles in John 20 that we recently read, peace be with you as the father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And to make this connection here between this reference of him as an apostle and this verse that we see in John 20, I think is is super interesting to see Jesus as the apostle. And it reminds me of a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, who once said, it's not fair to ask of others what you are not willing to do yourself. I don't know if you've ever had a boss or somebody telling you what to do or giving you instructions that you know they would never lower themselves to do that same job. They're telling you to do this, they're telling you to do that, but they'd never get into the trenches with you and help you. And it's hard to follow a boss like that. It's hard to follow the directions like that from someone who's unwilling. But the master calls me to represent him in this world through my example, through my conduct, through my speech, through my teaching. And all the while, I look right back to him as he did the exact same things he's asking me to do. And that's relatable. Mm -hmm. That's helpful for me to connect with Jesus because he wasn't above doing the things that he's asking me to do. And so am I too comfortable, kind of like we talked about on the last episode, in my comfort zone to get out there and convict the world of sin to speak the truth in love and in grace and in humility? Or am I waiting for a more convenient day to take the message to the lost? And Jesus never did these things. He, with boldness and love, got out there and did the work. And he's asking us, he's commanding us to do the same for him that he did for the Father. This is kind of a cool connection. Yeah, that idea of Jesus as one who's sent, like you said, he talks about being sent all the time in John that we just read. Right. But here being called an apostle, the one who is sent helps you to see that. And I like the connection you're making about how we too are sent. And and being sent, there's maybe an interesting word study in that because in Jeremiah, the false prophets are going about giving messages and mm-hmm. Jeremiah says they weren't sent and they don't have a word from God. And so it's it's a unique thing to be sent from God. And I think of those questions in, in Romans 10 that Paul asked, how are they to believe in him who never, they've never heard? How can they hear without someone preaching? How can they preach unless they are sent, unless somebody's sent? And then, of course, we sing that song, here am I, send me, right? And, and so I like that connection that you're making. Do I think of myself as sent, as someone who has a message and a mission, and I'm going out, go into all the world, bringing the gospel and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. All right, so let's move on to our next segment, which is scripture du jour. What is the soup du jour? It's the soup of the day. Mm, That sounds good. I'll have that. So we're in Hebrews chapter six here in today's reading on Thursday when the episode drops. Hebrews six is kind of a turning point in Mm -hmm. this conversation, in this sermon. He started it a little bit earlier in chapter 5 and verse 11 as he begins taking a detour, or you might call it a (laughs) parenthetical. This is one of those very Paul-like parenthetical statements. I don't know, maybe Paul wrote this sermon? I don't know. but uh, (laughs) (laughs) So he takes a detour from his conversation about Melchizedek, about the high priesthood, They're probably scratching their head, Melchizedek, who? And so Mm. he has to deal with some issues that are going on here in their understanding and their level of maturity. So what do you find here in this chapter that's helpful for you? I found 
a hope-filled mixed metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is in the at the end of today's reading in chapter 6, verses 18 to 20. And I'll kind of unpack two of the metaphors. There's even more of them, but you kind of have to have these two to be able to see the main point. But he says, at the end of verse 18, he says, We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of, there he is, Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to talk about Melchizedek. About this, we have much to say, but you are not ready for it, Brian. (laughs) No. (laughs) Thanks. Just uh, misquoting Hebrew writer there. But uh, no, I I, I think that the two pictures here that we have to meld in order to see this are of the temple and of the anchor. So the first one here is the temple with its restricted access that kind of makes me think of like a high security compound you might find at the CIA headquarters in Langley. And you think about, I don't know, in movies anyways, you find this series of checkpoints as you move inward and each one requires a higher clearance until maybe there's some room where only a few people can get into this server room or this war room or whatever it is. Except for Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible. Oh, I mean, if you drop from a cord I from mean, the ceiling, on. of course, yeah. yes. Uh, but the temple worked that way, in a way, showing God's holiness by restricting access. And so you're kind of only certain people can go into this room and then into this room. Mm-hmm. And in the innermost court, the most holy place, behind the curtain, as he says here, only one person the high priest could enter it and he could only enter it on one day of the year, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Mm -hmm. So when Hebrews says Jesus has gone into the inner place behind the curtain on our behalf, he's saying we have someone on the inside, (laughs) our guy, (laughs) our guy, the one representing us to God is the father's closest insider. And heaven is truly, literally the most holy place. It is where God's presence really rests. And we're on this side of the veil. We can't quite step into heaven, but we can come right up to that veil and know that our needs are heard and known in heaven and that we have Jesus there advocating for us. So the first metaphor is that if we can kind of get in our heads this picture of the temple and of that curtain and on the other side of that curtain, Jesus, our high priest at the right hand of God. But on top of that, number two, we find this nautical metaphor that our hope is like an anchor in heaven. And so I I think of our souls like little sailboats, you know, (laughs) in this big sea getting thrown around by the storms of life. And the Hebrew writer wants us to envision our hope as an anchor. I think of one of those super thick ropes, those ones that are as thick as your leg, you know, that Mm -hmm. they tie up big ships. And imagine that tied on one end to Christ at the right hand of God. And then it goes through the veil and, and it comes all the way down to earth. And on the other end, our soul is tied to that. And as long as you keep your hope fixed there with Christ, you might get battered around a bit, but our mooring will hold fast and we will weather the storm in the end. I think that's putting those two together, thinking about the veil and then understanding that it is solidly hooked on the (laughs) corner of the throne of Jesus, our hope. And it's not going anywhere as long as we stay connected to that rope. Well, all the while talking about the priests and going back into the history of the priesthood as they would on that Day of Atonement go into the most holy place, you see even a little bit of trepidation as they go in. There's not a lot of confidence, it seemed, in the old law and the Levitical system. And here, not only do we have a representative, but we have a representative we can anchor to. And putting those two things together in this verse is really helpful to see that, oh yeah, he's much better than the old system of priests and offerings and sacrifices that used to be made long ago that these people are tempted to go back to. Yeah, and I mean, whatever you might be tempted to go back to or I might be tempted to go back to, the argument holds this idea that our hope is worth holding on to because if you let go of that, there's nothing. 
Yeah. There's nothing to hold you and get you through. As I think maybe if I'm looking at your notes here, you might be about to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I am. But uh, before I do, I am singing We Have an Anchor That Keeps the Soul. Uh, yes, absolutely. As soon as you said that, I mean, we're all singing that now. So We'll have to put a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Okay, so back up a little bit here in Hebrews 6. And I found this interesting question that I've grappled with and I've struggled with from time to time. And it's the question, how far gone is too far gone? And Mm. the issue is backsliding here. That is one of the Hebrew writer's main purposes in writing is to keep these people anchored and to keep them from backsliding. And so he says in chapter six, verse four, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. And this has always been a tough passage for me to wrestle with. The writer here makes it pretty clear right off the bat that it's impossible to restore someone that once knew the Lord, but then turned their back on him and fell away. And you couple that with passages like 2 Peter chapter 2, Matthew chapter 12, verse 45, It seems so hopeless. When do we cross Mm. that line from committing sin to just full-on backsliding? And I think that's the end of this verse. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. So he kind of couches this really serious picture of where they would be if they decided to turn back, the impossibility of it all, with the hopefulness that they have a chance still to have a better outcome. And if this was just completely hopeless, if they had turned their back on the Lord and it was just pointless for him to even write these things, why would we even have the book of Hebrews? Why would he spend the time if there was no chance for them to come back? And so there is that grace that we can still call on and receive if we are willing to repent. But I think the key there is if we're willing to repent. The hardness and the deceitfulness of sin is a serious thing that we will have to grapple with if we turn away, if we backslide, if we make a pattern of turning from the Lord and turning our back on him, then that callousness builds up and it's just harder and harder to turn around. And I think that's what he's dealing with here. The gravity of what he's dealing with here is that it's a pretty bleak picture if we see and taste all of the goodness and the best things that God has offered us and then say, no, that's not for me. Not that we can't turn back, but it's going to be so hard for us to do that. And I've seen that in so many cases and I've been close to that from time to time. You know, there have been times, which I think we're going to talk about in just a few minutes, where even for me, that's been on the horizon. And Mm -hmm. fortunately, I was able to turn back. Fortunately, I was able to come to my senses, but we cannot discount the seriousness of what this all means. No, I exactly. That word impossible should frighten us. Yeah. It should it should be a wake up call. It's a it is that dark downward spiral, that kind of Romans 118, the wrath of God being revealed as God gives us over to our desires and just lets us at some point, if we're resistant to him, lets us keep going downward and believe lies and keep thinking and pursuing evil. And even as it becomes less satisfying, we chase it more. And that is, it is a very frightening thing. And like you said, all you have to do is look around at the real life cases and see all of our friends and family that have experienced this. And, and what are you going to say to them? I mean, they know every argument you're going to make, every <laughs> yeah. truth about the gospel, every every good thing from tasting the goodness of the word of God and looking to the powers of the age to come. All of these things he's saying, like, what are you going to offer? Yeah, <laughs> this is the best stuff. And it's been rejected. So let's get into our last segment here. And we're going to talk a little bit about our 
personal struggles with spiritual growth. It's easy to look at these Jewish Christians here that the writer is speaking to and kind of picture them over there and you view them at a distance and see the issues that they're having and say, oh man, those people had a lot of troubles. But Mm -hmm. I think all of us have experienced our own troubles. So maybe let's expose the soft underbelly of our own lives (laughs) and, (laughs) and talk about some of the issues that we've had growing up in our push toward maturity. Fun segment this is going to be. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, I think it's important to talk about this stuff as we have difficulties, as we have challenges. I mean, like you talked about, there's a lot of things I could talk about it, about different periods um, when I've struggled with doubt and with all kinds of different things. But something that I find myself still plagued with is these stops and starts. Mm hmm. I think one of my biggest challenges is consistency. And I I have lulls where I find myself just lacking energy and I give up ground in my habits or I keep going in those habits, but it just becomes kind of going through the motions. And in those valleys, sometimes it even takes me a few days before I even realize I'm on a downward trend, Mm -hmm. that I'm spending too much time on meaningless stuff and forgetting to be present with people forgetting to really seek God's face with zeal, forgetting the things that really matter. Because there's so much in life and even in sort of the business and busyness of religion that you can feel like you're doing religious things, but not actually pursuing and being worshipful towards God, not actually really ministering to people, not actually doing the stuff that matters most. And I mean, it's just that's something that that I always have kind of on my radar as something I'm watching out for and mindful of turning that lever the other way when I start to kind of go downward. Mm -hmm. And there are some no matter what habits that help me keep on track, especially things like the church, you know, those habits where I'm accountable to people. And, you know, it's like the Hebrew writer says, hey, don't give up. Don't abandon assembling together. In chapter 10, he's going to say, because we need that. We need to be stirred on. And so, you know, every Sunday I know where I'll be. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. that's not just because that's my job now, but that's like all (laughs) my life. That was ingrained in me. And I'm so very thankful for that. I want my kids to have that ingrained because sometimes you might go seven days there there are periods of my life certainly where i've i've probably gone seven days without hearing god's word but i i'm gonna hear it then and be challenged and at least have an opportunity for somebody to knock something into my hard skull i guess (laughs) um so you know that kind of thing and and you know having a spouse having a wife that is a godly woman and just having certain kinds of commitments to keep holding on, keep listening, keep praying, know that the Lord will see me through those things. As long as I don't abandon him, if I'm seeking him, I'm going to find my way to staying on track. And and it looks different. You know, sometimes it doesn't feel like some great, profound, meaningful experience, but you just keep doing what you need to do and seeking him and, and you find your way to doing the things that matter most. Does that make sense? (laughs) It does. Totally. Yeah. Especially even in our family right now. And maybe a lot of families are dealing with this with the pandemic and a lot of changes in worship and services being canceled and certain things that have been going on. We just recently started back up our Wednesday evening Bible study. And as we were going back yesterday, getting in the car and going through all the prep to get ready to go, there was just kind of this feeling like, We haven't done this in a while. We kind of got used to for a very long time staying home. And I knew that when we went, there was going to be encouragement there. And it's kind of those no matter what habits sometimes that help us keep on track. I think we all, I specifically have gone through these stops and starts a lot. Staying consistent with things is, if you ask my wife, not one of my skills or positive traits <laughs> i'm surprised at that you're you're like an you're like a solid dude compared to me <laughs> <laughs> well it depends on who you ask but uh, yeah i'm right there with you i think these kinds of intentions i'll have just these broad plans and big ideas and then weeks later you find them fizzle out kind of in those 
New Year's resolutions ways. Mm. And it is hard to keep with a routine. And not only that, but to keep your heart engaged while you have those routines. And I think pushing past that and relying on people, leaning on people is a big way, at least for me, to get through those times, which kind of leads into something that I was going to share here. Mm -hmm. And that's the times over the past decade, maybe two decades, in which I've dealt with loneliness. It's kind of interesting if you know me very well, if you knew me when I was growing up. When I was a younger man (laughs) in my teen years and early 20s, I was just an incredible extrovert. I would talk to anybody. Yeah. (laughs) I love talking to people. And I'm still like that from time to time. But as I've gotten older, I have become more of an introvert than a lot of people realize or a lot of people know. And you ask my wife and she would definitely tell you that I have been quieter and I don't do all the crazy outlandish things that I used to do as a younger man. And as I feel myself kind of getting into that introverted, feeling like a homebody, not really wanting to get out there kind of mode over the past decade or so, I think there's been a much bigger struggle for me to connect with people to build strong, lasting, best friendships. And in some ways for me, there have been people, quote unquote, who have moved away. (laughs) And, (laughs) you know, these friends that I've had that I've... Supposed friends. Supposed (laughs) friends who decided to travel across the United States and, uh, you know, have kind of from time to time left me feeling alone. And I, I not only see this on myself, but I even see this with my daughter, there have been people who are very close to her, friends of hers, who've gone away, and and she's also had to deal with this. And there is a sense that I am kind of by myself. It's a challenge for me to build closer bonds within the church and constantly reminding myself that there's technology here that I can use. And that's one of the big reasons why we started doing this podcast was just so that we could have an opportunity to talk uh, yeah. once a week. And that these opportunities that I need to keep reminding myself exist. Not only the fact that I'm maybe pulling away from people or not being involved with people as as much as I used to be, putting myself out there and challenging myself, not only to allow people to sharpen me in that iron sharpening iron kind of way from Proverbs 27, but also being that kind of way for other people. And I think that's something that when I look at people like Elijah after he was in the cave and basically wallowing in self-pity, feeling alone. And then God told him, no, you need to get up. You're not alone. Find a friend, go find Elisha and get back to work. And that's just a constant reminder, something I'm trying to push myself with, something I struggle with a lot. So there's my revelation of the day. If you didn't know I'm an introvert or starting to become one, (laughs) here we are. Yes, it's interesting. I have watched you become an introvert. <laughs> and it was strange whenever I realized, you know, and, and you and I think Sherilyn was like, well, of course, Brian's an introvert or something like that. And I was like, what? No, he's this extrovert. What are you talking about? Yeah. But but yeah, I, I can see that. I, I think when I take personality tests, I'm called my personality type is called the introverted extrovert. Yeah, <laughs> because it kind of some there's some people that it it wears you out to be with people even though you love to be with people <laughs> you then have to go and you have to kind of recharge because you're always trying to take care of all the people around you and you're concerned that everybody's being looked out for or whatever but Adrian and I talk about this idea of different kinds of friendships a mm-hmm. lot and about some of the words that you used and phrases you used. I think there's a lot of wisdom in what you talked about, this idea of putting yourself out there and being a friend, which is different than the things sometimes we show up at friendships with an expectation thinking this is what I'm going to get out of a friendship. And what I've learned is that when I really show up and make myself invested and available in that time that I'm with someone and I really am intending, I hold a strong kind of deliberate purpose toward trying to listen to them, trying to connect with them, trying to build them up. And I am not hiding myself. Right. This is sounding all probably very touchy feely, but this is <laughs> my own kind of journey because I, I do, as we'll talk about in a minute, tend to go 
into a kind of a comfortable shell. But whenever I really show up and, and say, I'm going to, I'm going to be real and I'm going to invest in people and be a friend and say what I think really not like I'm going to speak my mind and mm -hmm. say whatever I think, not like that, but, but really just listen and be honest and, and connect and, just kind of deal with the consequences of that um, because it's scary to really show up that way. But man, it makes such a difference, not just to other people, but to me. And those are the relationships that I end up walking away feeling like I really have a real friend. Man, I love that guy. Man, I appreciate <laughs> that sister, whoever it is, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I appreciate what you shared there and, and your thoughts on that. And maybe I'll go from there into <laughs> my next challenge, which is the curse of the comfortable. Is yeah. how I named it. Oh, yeah. And I find that for me, that comfort zone, which you already brought up earlier, as we talked about Hebrews, has this magnetic pull to it. Even as I'm fighting to step outside of it, I know that it's going to, every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in, as <laughs> Al Pacino says. For me, stepping outside my comfort zone means going outside of relationships in the church and really working to build connections with people like my neighbors or people that I, I run into and try to try to intentionally run into in various different outside contexts, whether it's the kids' schools or the different different places. People in your community. And in the community, exactly. Yeah. Really trying to build connections to where I'm building friendships with people and I'm finding ways to serve. And I, I, one of the things that I found is a really powerful avenue for our family is hospitality, whether that means going out to people or inviting people in, having hosting things, which is really particularly hard right now. It's a lot harder <laughs> to there's, do. There's not a lot that you can do, but those are things that I have to push myself out to make those connections beyond the community of the church, which is uh, which is pretty easy for me in in a lot of ways. And then also it means stepping out of my comfort zone also means speaking courageously from my heart every time I get a chance to teach or preach or address anyone, you know, speaking as the oracles of God and really not just getting it too far into interpretive questions that I might find interesting, but really remembering to declare the life-changing truth at the heart of the matter. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like there is something that has to be said. The word I think about the, the word oracle that prophets talk about. And that word literally means burden, like the prophet's burden. Here's the burden that I carry to speak. <laughs> it hurts me as much as it hurts you. <laughs> yeah, this is going to hurt me as much as it hurts you. Uh, I never believed that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard sometimes to just remember to choose the messages and the words that have to be spoken and to, to ask those questions. What needs to be said? What word from God needs to be heard from the scriptures, of course? And so I've really tried. I've made a commitment. I know in both of those areas, I'm going to always probably have to keep nudging myself out and being intentional and prayerful and mindful of staying true to what God wants me to do. But I know that I'm most effective whenever I'm like all of us in our own areas, whatever it is, stepping out into that territory of risk and sacrifice and faith. It's uh, hard for me not to think about Peter again. And we, yeah. we always pick on Peter, but he's so relatable as he's out there dealing with the Gentiles, connecting with them. And then the Jews come along and he retreats and goes and hangs out with the Jews, leaves the Gentiles behind, kind of ignores them, and Paul has to call him out for it. Mm -hmm. Just that comfort zone of not wanting to look a certain way, not wanting people to view us a certain way, just that easy magnetic pull, like you described it, that yeah. sometimes we just want to be comfortable. That's not going to be as effective as if we just boldly did the uncomfortable thing, and like Jesus did, spent his time around prostitutes and tax collectors and people who religious folks viewed as utterly in sin. 
And those are the people who need us the most. And it's easy to say that on paper, but man, is it hard to really put that into practice by getting out there and serving people, all people like we should. Yeah, I, I like the way you said that. And it really reminds me of the joy of embracing discomfort. And we talked a, a few weeks ago about a quote that talked about the adventure of grace. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. faith is an adventure. It really calls us to step out and follow the Lord and do difficult things, but to do it with joy, knowing God is with us and he can lead us through it. And um, the book of Jeremiah that I've been, I've been teaching a class through uh, has this passage. It says, if you can't run with men, how will you compete with horses? <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and, and if you can't walk in the safe lands, basically, I'm totally paraphrasing this. How can you deal with the jungle down by the Jordan River? How can you deal with these difficult lands? In other words, you're going into a danger zone. It's going to be more difficult because Jeremiah was complaining about how hard things are. And it, instead of saying, yeah, it'll be okay, God said, well, I'll be with you, but no, you better get strong because if you can't run with men, how are you going to compete with horses? It's going to get even harder. And if you can't deal with this safe area, how is it going to be when you get into the jungle? And I think we have to learn to embrace the jungle, embrace the race with horses. <laughs> Welcome to the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. Okay, so let me share my last one here, and then we'll wrap this thing up. So, as you may know, I am very easily distracted. Very easily distracted. I am just, it is hard for me to stay on task a lot of times. And there have been so many times, especially in my early 20s and early 30s, where I let my hobbies, I let my interests, I let even my education cloud my mind and fill up my time. To the point where I was pushing for this earthly goal, I'm pushing for something on the horizon, getting out of school, achieving this level of success, getting to this level in my hobbies or whatever I was doing at the time. And it was this never ending pursuit of more that just seemed to follow up with more after that. I started to realize, and this still plagues me even today from time to time, but how much my focus was turned away from God onto these things. There wasn't anything wrong, quote unquote, technically with these pursuits. It made me more easily justify those things and say, oh, there's nothing wrong with it. And mm -hmm. I see their value in my life. But at some point, I finally woke up and started to look around and take stock and realize, and I've been really distracted and I haven't really been focused on what I need to be focused on. And it reminds me a lot of Haggai chapter one, verse four through six, where God through Haggai is basically saying, y'all in your paneled houses, as you look out of your windows, what do you see? Mm -hmm. You see my house lying in ruins. Then he talks about how they've worked and they've clothed themselves, but no one's warm. They earn wages and put them in bags with holes. And every time I read that, that just totally sums up all of these hobbies and all of this push for all the things that I spent my time doing. I worked really hard, but what did I get out of it? Nothing that meant anything in the long run. There was no lasting happiness in those things. And so all it really did was suck away my time and my spiritual muscles, my, my heart really atrophied and was malnourished during that time. And I think if I could go back and talk to my younger self and say anything, it would probably be that you need to spend more time in Bible study. You need to spend more time in prayer. You need to meditate more. You need to focus yourself on loving service to your neighbors and balance that with hobbies and other interests. But only after you've done the first principles and the, the important things first can you fill up the rest of your time with other things. And I don't know if my younger self would have listened to me, but <laughs> I think I would just look to our younger generation and encourage them that all these extracurricular activities, as important as they may seem, in the long run, they may become a distraction for you that will make it really hard for you to spiritually grow the way you want to. And we're just a busy people and we love to feel accomplished when we're busy. And that may be our downfall. And it, it certainly could have been mine if I kept down that path. You're dropping wisdom, man. <laughs> dropping wisdom on young Brian's head. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. No, yeah, you're you're totally right. This and I, I need to hear it still today. 
constantly. Just that simple message of staying on task with what you know matters. And we need those wake up calls, those reminders, sometimes thinking about my mortality, honestly, Mm -hmm. has has kept me focused on there's just death is quite a wake up call that helps you remember what matters and remember kind of putting everything into context. The living take it Um, to heart. The living take it to heart. Yeah. And having the right kind of people around you helps, I think, the, the right kind of and not just the people, I guess, but like what you're listening to, what you're spending time with. I mean, sure. the podcasts I listen to, a la Bible Geeks, but all the other podcasts I listen to are like hanging out with people. You know, I feel like I spend time with some of those podcasts as oh, much yeah. as I spend with the people I'm talking to. And, you know, all the influences in your life, if, if I can surround myself with those that are really pushing to memorize a bunch of verses or to think to stretch in in prayer life or in service. I mean, every time I talk to people that are really reaching for spiritual growth, I walk away challenged and encouraged to remember what what I really care about and my passion, my my love for the things that actually are lovely and praiseworthy and honorable and just and true is renewed. So, that's a good reminder. Okay. So there's our soft underbelly. <laughs> Maybe that leads into our challenge this week, which I think you have. Yeah. So are you ready to share your soft underbelly? (laughs) (laughs) The challenge is to share your challenges with someone in your life and ask them to pray for you. And there, there really is something important and I think helpful to talking about this stuff. And sometimes it's just as helpful. I mean, it was just as helpful to me to hear some of the things you've struggled with as it is to share with you some of my challenges. And and I think those are important spiritual conversations. We don't get stuck in kind of a, a false, everything is okay kind of world. We need <laughs> to be talking fine. about what real, this is fine. <laughs> Talk about what real spiritual growth looks like. And man, prayer works and, and put each other to work on uh, on helping us grow. Sounds good. I think being a little bit vulnerable is always a good thing, as uncomfortable as it might be. So, <laughs> thanks, everyone, for tuning into the Bible Geeks podcast. You can find us on our website at BibleGeeks.fm. You can find show notes for this episode in your podcast player of choice or at BibleGeeks.fm slash 85. If you want to follow along with our Into the Book Bible reading program, that's at BibleGeeks.fm slash Into the Book. And if you want to contact us, we're always available. We're answering emails all the time, so reach out to us and tell us what you want to hear about on upcoming episodes, either at BibleGeeks.fm slash contact or through our Facebook page. That would be great. Until next week, everyone, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Shalom. Shalom.